the lead this morning is the very latest on a story that we reported exactly four weeks ago on this show uh, about the college football Super League. And I know a lot of people laughed and shouted us down at that point. Yesterday, the Athletics, Seth Mandel and Andrew Marchand put out a piece that essentially chapter and verse parroted out what we told you a month ago. And that is that the college football Super League is very real. And there's a lot of questions about what the structure of this league would be. How is this league going to operate? As we told you, Division I, the Power Four conferences, there is no doubt that all of those clubs, including SMU, are going to be included in the, in the, the College Football Super League. But let's get one thing very clear from the start. This College Football Super League is going to happen. It is not a matter of if, but when. And one of the major questions that was bandied about on uh, Twitter yesterday was, well, ESPN and Fox are avoiding meetings talking about this. Let me take you behind the scenes because I can tell you point blank yesterday, sources confirmed to us that ESPN, Fox, the Big Ten, and the SEC have all had significant and substantial conversations about the college football Super League as it is being called. Um, I, I believe very firmly that ESPN is well aware of this. They are well down the road in their preparations for what is next in college football. And the issue continues to be, as we have talked about on this show for well over a year, going back to when NIL uh, became a thing a couple of years ago. These lawsuits are what's going to move this process ahead. Because as we said, and as Andrew Marshan and uh, Stuart Mandel at The Athletics said as well, the financial viability of the current system of college football is not viable. It is not sustainable. It is not a long-term financial model because I am told, and most people in college athletics believe, that these lawsuits are going to go in favor of the athlete. And you'll remember that we talked about um, the NIL universities being able to pay athletes and the fact that they lost that ruling in court. And we told you on this show, the NCAA was not going to fight or appeal that ruling. And that is a very, very telling action. They have not fought or appealed that ruling. And why is that? Because they know they cannot win. And right now, whether it is the NCAA as a management body or the membership at all of these universities, they are pulling their pennies together because I think they know that they are going to be on the hook for billions. And the only way that you fix the financial model is you make more money. And that's exactly what the College Football Super League is. And I think we need to be very clear and very unequivocal about one thing. ESPN and Fox, CBS to a lesser extent, NBC to a lesser extent, they are all having conversations. And I will continue to tell you this. It was confirmed again yesterday, as we have confirmed multiple times on this show. ESPN and Fox are in constant and consistent communication with each other, and they are on a regular basis speaking to their partners in college football. The SEC and the Big Ten are in regular communications with Fox, ESPN, CBS, NBC. If you don't believe that Notre Dame is talking to NBC regularly, you are out of your mind. Jake, where do you come down on this? Do you believe that the college football Super League is an eventuality? Where are you at? Where are you at on it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's uh, I, I would say an inevitability. I, I think that the, the college football system, as it is known today, um, is dead. It's broken. It's 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 not viable. It, it doesn't work for you know, the landscape and where the landscape is going. And I think that's really where these conversations come from. You know, um, you know, guys who run college football conferences, um, commissioners, you know, leaders, they're not stupid. They understand why the NFL model is so prolific and why it works so well and why the NFL continues to dominate uh, viewership in professional sports. It's easy to understand. It It, it, it is all decided on the field. And there's really no drama with, with hey, someone didn't get in because of this or that or whatever. And I think, you know, when whether you're looking at the money side or you're looking at, you know, how teams get into the playoffs, if you will, in college football, 
I, I, I think that that leaders in college football no longer want to have committees or computers or people deciding who should get in over another. What they want is a streamlined process that works for everybody involved. And it has to work on the PL sheet. It's got to work in NIL. It's got to work for 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 TV partners, obviously. Um, and, and I think all those things can be accomplished. And and that's why I say, like, you know, the things we reported uh, a month ago now um, are, are pretty much chapter and verse in this article that came out yesterday, which is. Hey man, there's going to be there's going to be separate divisions based on geography, so we're going to cut down travel costs. There is going to be a best of the G5 uh league that can that can play up into the top divisions. Um you know, like it, it really just comes down to what what these court filings wind up being, what these rulings wind up being, and then figuring it out with the TV partners. But yes. but for anybody who who's sitting here today after reading this article saying things like oh man like this is this is not going to happen nobody wants this this isn't good i don't know how anybody no matter where you're at on college football comes to that conclusion because everything that i see says that this makes both the school money the league money and the player money and obviously the tv partners money and once you do that you're you're in a great place and that's what college football needs yeah i think it's going to be very difficult for the ncaa and its membership to continue <clears throat> i would think in 2 years as we've talked about they're going to lose multiple lawsuits and it is going to be very difficult for them to pay their bills because we're not talking about pennies on the dollar. We're talking about real dollars here going out the door. And you've got to find a way to supplement that. Now, I think one of the most important parts of this is where ESPN and Fox, the two major stakeholders, CBS, it would be, you know, very close to CBS and, uh, or excuse me, Fox and ESPN, as far as financially leveraged in these situations, ESPN, and then largely Fox and CBS secondarily are going to make this determination about timeline. Because one of the things that I think is so important to remember is that every one of these conferences is now locked locked into a long-term TV deal. And it's very much like the ACC. ESPN is going to determine the fate of the ACC. But what did I tell you a month ago? I'm going to tell you the same thing I said a month ago. I don't believe that we ever get there with the ACC because I believe that we are going to see a seismic change when it comes to things like this Super League. And you look at where ESPN is. ESPN owns the rights now to the Big 12, the SEC, and the ACC, the college football playoff. They have a significant stake in college basketball. And again, I go back to the importance of college basketball because it is without question now, a not an option. It is a necessity to drive revenue through the college basketball system. And when we talk about who's the best conference and who's going to make the most money, it's why yesterday when we talked about the Big 12 delaying their Mexico initiative, that's a big deal. That's a revenue stream that the Big 12 has to tap. You have to have a significant presence in money-making endeavors when it comes to college basketball. But make no mistake about it, ESPN has the largest say on how this Super League goes forward. They are in conversations with their partners in all of these leagues. And it is not a matter of if, but when this comes together. ESPN, I think, is well aware that there is a need. And I I don't even think well aware is the right way to say it. I was told point blank yesterday, unequivocally, ESPN recognizes that college football cannot continue the way that it is. That the college football playoff, if you go to 100, does not make enough money. What has to happen is private money has to come in. And you want to talk about collectives and donors? They are never going to be more important than they are going to be over the next decade in college athletics. Because no matter how much money TV partners kick in, it is not going to be enough to cover the expenses that are going to be required, A, to to settle litigation, and B, to pay athletes as employees. Because I think we're going to be in a in a, a, a contractor situation, this is call it a 1099 if you like, but you're going to be in a position where you are going to have to directly compensate college athletes. You are going to have to directly compensate college football players at a significantly higher level than everybody else. 
to do that, you are going to need investors. You are going to need, call it private money, whatever you want to call it. You are going to need people that are not affiliated with universities to kick money in, to provide the ability to be a thriving, dominant football program. I think that's really what the next bridge here is. How does private money and how do donors and collectives play in this process? Yeah, and I think football should be treated differently than any other sport. You know, I mean, it, it, it is the the king of revenue now, and it will continue to be that as we move forward, to which I say, I have no issue if you want to come up with a model that pays athletes. I, I, I think that, you know, college football has gotten to a point, um, you know, at the P5 level where, you know, it, it obviously is the feeder system to the NFL. So if yes. it is that and everyone agrees on that, then why are we trying to dance around this idea of paying athletes? Why not just accept the fact that these guys are professional athletes, one, and they're just doing what's required in the classroom to be able to play? I mean, let's not let's not like create some fantasy land situation here. These guys are in school to play football, not go to class. They're football players, then they're going to class so that they can play football. That's what it is for nine out of ten guys. And and I think that that we we all get scared about that. We're all like, oh, yes. they're student athletes. Very much. They're going to school to get an education. It's like, no, dude. No, they're not. They're going to school to get to the league. Their mission is to get to the league as soon as possible. And most guys wind up talking about the fact that it is that's their mission because they want to help their family. They want to get their mama house. They want to do all these things. You know, they want to make a difference in their in their family. And, and to that end, I say, great, that's fine. I'm cool with it. You know, everybody else who's not a football player can do whatever the hell they want to do. Why would we, why would we put these kids in a box? And so that's why I say, yes, let the private money come in, let change the structure, allow schools to, to, to compete for players because ultimately that's good for everybody. Why do you think the Stefan Diggs trade is such a big deal in the NFL? Because people are competing for the best talent in the NFL. Why would we not have that same dynamic in college well, football? And, and I think if you look at the model that we told you about on, what did we say, March 3rd, I believe it was, or March 6th. If you look at the model we talked about, it is conferences with divisions and, a, and a, the ability for teams to play their way into the postseason, which is exactly what the NFL has, and that's exactly what we laid out. And again, I would say confirmed by The Athletic because it, it is exactly what private money and television needs. And I continue, again, one of my guys in the TV industry yesterday said you were spot on, Monty. Hey, Monty. Hey, Monty. You were spot on when you talked about the college football championship on Saturday and the NFL, the Super Bowl on Sunday. And I think you are going to see that, that ESPN – and its its TV partners um, are going to have a a TV model that is going to be very similar to the NFL because I I think there's this belief out there that in TV land money is just endless that it it is oh everybody's got money in TV they don't have money in TV because trust me we're in sales professionally for a living yeah we make our money and pay our bills on sales. Now, our good looks, I agree, our good looks make us a ton of money. They do. There's they no do. doubt about that. And, and you know, it's unfortunate for you that you don't have those good looks, but it is what it is. And you don't wear a size 15 shoe such as I'm like myself. <laughs> Stay hard. I'm just saying that when you're in sales for a living, this is a very challenging ad market. And, yes, while it is true that the Chevys and the Fords of the world, and, yes, while it is true that your Budweiser's and your Modelo's and you have people that spend money, but it is very difficult to get people to spend money in this climate right now. It is very, very difficult. And if you don't think that things like the election, the political cycle, the fact that we're back up to $85 a barrel for oil, uh, you, if you don't think that that's making a significant impact on the fact that in the ad market, less people are spending less money, and, and maybe the right way to say it is more people are spending less money, you're crazy. If you don't understand that people like FanDuel and the other gambling entities in this country are struggling to convert consumers, you're out of your mind. It is more difficult now than it has ever been at any time in history for TV companies to make billions of dollars. Well, and, and I think that the advantage that college football could have is, is that they are 
the the second fiddle to the NFL. And and I well, like like yesterday we're watching the Padre game. And what do you notice about Petco Park? It, Callaway golf is all over Petco Park right now. And it's like it's that type of thought process when I look at college football and I'm like, "Hey man, like you're a huge thing in our country." Like, yeah, the Chevys and the Fords and you know, whatever private money entity you want to look at, all these different companies want to be involved. They're saying, Hey, with our less money that less people are spending, we want to take that less money and we want to pour it into your sport. But to do that, you have to have the proper structure in place. And that's what this is about ultimately. So hundred percent. So it's not about whether or not the TV partners want to do this. The TV partners have been trying to do this for, However the hell long now, we just haven't had enough people come around the idea and say, yeah, you know what? It is possible. And, and we need to come up with a structure that works for everybody, including the athlete. And now it's just simply being held up by, you know, these court cases involving the NCAA. Uh, and once that's taken care of, then you can get to it. Cause again, and this is what we talk about with the ACC grant of rights, ESPN's in control. ESPN's in a position where they have a strong grip on this sport and and conferences. So if you can get with ESPN and you can say, hey, understand that we're we're under agreement right now, but this is what we're all trying to do. Is that something that that you could see getting involved in? Yeah. Obviously, yes, it is something we could see ESPN getting involved in. So that's why I say, while the article talks about contracts and you know the FBS schools, uh, you know all these schools are under contract. The reality is. When you sign a contract with someone, if both parties agree to change that contract and get into something that's mutually beneficial for everybody, that's going to happen. So don't get confused about the current landscape and that holding anything back because I don't believe it does. I just think you got to get to the table. And I, I think when we talk about the biggest hurdles, these lawsuits are a massive hurdle. The NIL litigation that we've been talking about on this show for a year now, th- that's a, a massive hurdle. I think you're also looking at a a situation where you're going to have to find a way to unify the lower tiers of college football. Because as as I continue to tell you, this Super League doesn't mean that the Big Ten goes away. The Super League doesn't mean that any conference goes away. Those conferences are going to stay intact. You are going to have a situation where college football fundamentally changes the way that they make money and determine their champion. But as far as these other sports go, you're going to have to find a way to generate more revenue through them to compensate the universities for the money that they're going to have to put out for these lawsuits at NIL. I think that is a, that is the biggest hurdle is making more money. I think the other hurdle that stands in the way here, you're going to have to find a way to bring in and make it, it feels almost dirty or incestuous. How do we get private money, money that's not affiliated with these universities or these programs? How do you marry college football and private money in a way that doesn't feel dirty or under the table or, you know, that that you're paying juice or how do you pay back that private, that private money? How do you make them whole and profitable? And it's something that I, that I think the, the, the NCAA and its membership are very reticent to do. It's something that that I think it is the great unknown. It is the abyss of college athletics. How do you go from this? Well, we're here to get Jimmy through college so he can be a great dentist. The American dream. Right? Like, how do you get from that perspective that they're here and their compensation is a scholarship? How do we get from that to this is a for-profit no longer nonprofit. This is a for-profit enterprise where we have outside investors that are powering this sport. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you get there through through getting more people to accept the fact that that's going to happen one way or the other. And and, and and I think that the the biggest issue is that the Charlie Bakers of the world and everyone that's on his side of this conversation, um, you know, are in kind of a, a, a conundrum here because... Well, on one hand, it's like, yeah, that that dynamic that you just described is obviously what college athletics has been for as long as we've known them, right? Yes. I mean, that's that's what we know it to be. But on the other hand, this this thousand pound gorilla is going to come and change sports, it, 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 collegiate sports. It's going to walk in the room. 
and say, hey, dude, we've got billions of dollars sitting here. You guys are getting piped in court. We might want to find a way to take that money. So it, it it's incumbent on the NCAA to say, okay, yes, we don't love this. We don't love the fact that the concept of the student athlete is inevitably going to go away just under football. Because again, for other, we're not talking about other sports here, right? This is a football conversation. So for football players, especially at the power four level, yeah, we need to bring all that money in and we need to change the system. And to that end, I would say little school that no one's ever heard of, this also matters to them because if you can play up and you get one year out of every 20 and you popped off for six or seven million because you won a couple games, that's going to be a big deal for the system in its entirety. But I also think you are going to turn off a significant number of universities who just don't give a, a, a rip about making money in, in athletics. And I this is the this is why there was such a divide at Michigan over Jim Harbaugh. Because the the academics at, at Michigan wanted nothing to do with a, it making Jim Harbaugh the highest paid coach in the history of college football. And there is that divide uh in universities like Michigan where mm-hmm. academia doesn't want to be seen as a cheater, where academia doesn't want to be seen going to court to defend. And we we this is not new. We told you about this during the the football season. Yeah, there was a large swath of the personnel at Michigan who out and out protested going to court to defend Jim Harbaugh. Washington State, where they essentially had faculty and staff threatening a sit-in at Kirk Schultz's office because they did not want to continue to dump bad money into their athletic department that was no longer going to play a prominent role in a conference that was dying. And lo and behold, what happened? The conference died and Washington State's in a terrible equity position. But if you look at both of those situations, the common factor is there wasn't enough money. Academia, folks who are in academia world, don't give a damn what you're doing. If you're making, let's call it $100 a month and what you want to do only costs you a dollar. Look right. at Arizona. Look at Arizona. Exactly. Arizona right? was using their daily money. Pay the light bill. Buy new pencils. Pay the gardener. Their daily money was being used to fund the athletic department because they had so little support from their fan base. And they were not selling tickets and they were not selling corn dogs. I don't know if Oak State James is here, but sorry, I know that hurts your heart. They were not selling concessions. (laughs) So they were struggling to be financially viable in athletics. So they were using their daily money. They had an accounting error that cost them $240 million because they were funding their athletics out of their own pocket. Those days are over now because $240 million is going to look like couch cushion money Mm -hmm. when these NIL lawsuits come down. Because the other thing that nobody wants to talk about it isn't this dastardly NCAA. Who's the NCAA? Yeah. All of these universities. Yeah, and you've been saying this for a long time. The NCAA is not some you know entity that just is screwing these universities. Who made the NIL policy that now has them on the, the cusp of losing billions of dollars? Every one of these universities approved not allowing NIL, approved not allowing people and athletes to make money. They approved the way that they have done business for the last hundred years. And when I say they, all these universities, that's who the NCAA is. It's made up of universities that compete on the athletic fields in college athletics. That's what the NCAA is. So we can sit here and we can try and victimize, uh, you know, these universities and say, oh man, they're just, they're, they're in such a bad spot. They're the ones who approve this. They're the ones who said no to NIL. It's the old hairs that didn't, you know, that are holding on to their money who didn't want to pay these damn kids that are getting a free education. They're the ones that are responsible for this. Yes. Stop blaming the kid. Stop blaming the, the Ed O'Bannons who wanted to get paid because he appeared in a video game. Stop blaming the Jeremy Blooms who wanted to ski in the Olympics and couldn't. And stop blaming the kid. Start blaming the old men who didn't want to give up. They didn't want to give up a penny of their money. Yeah. All right. Before we get to you, a couple of things I want to clarify here. Uh, where do ESPN and Fox stand on the college football Super League? This is a really important point because I think the athletic got this completely wrong in their article. And 
I'm not going to tell you who we're talking to, but we are talking to very well-placed sources at, at, in the TV industry network it, uh, networks. We are talking to people who have direct knowledge of these situations. And I want to make this clear. ESPN and Fox, CBS and NBC, we are told point blank by multiple sources, do not oppose a college football super league. They do not want to get themselves in a position, the TV networks, ESPN, Fox, CBS, and NBC, don't want to put themselves in a position to be paying the bill for these NIL lawsuits and all this litigation that's coming down the line here pretty quickly, if we're being honest. Yeah. That's why there's there's hesitation from the TV networks to jump in bed with the NCAA and, and really these universities and conferences and just run away with a college football super league because they don't want to be in a position where they're being leveraged to pay for these lawsuits. I will again reiterate, we have been told point blank that Greg Sankey, Tony Petiti, Brett Yormark for that matter, they've been having conversations with their TV partners on the regular. There is an open line of communication between Fox and ESPN and NBC and CBS. They have regularly scheduled calendar sessions where they talk about the industry, where they talk about the issues. I was told directly yesterday that ESPN and Fox have had direct conversations about this issue, that Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti have spoken directly to Fox and ESPN about the future of the Super League and the future of college football and the urgency that is needed to move this process forward. So I believe from what I am told, and I think we have a pretty stellar track record on this show of reporting things. What I am told is there is no hesitation from the television networks to create a super league because their money is going to be made whole. As Jake pointed out earlier, it's a contract. Yeah, You have two parties to contracts. Both party here, both parties here are incentivized to move forward because if they don't move forward, the NCAA is going to be insolvent. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if the NCAA is insolvent and there's no money being made in college football, the current model dies and those contracts die with it. Yep. So it's simply a matter of when, not if, these these deals get made. And the idea that a super league is, you know, somehow in peril could not be further from the truth. Yeah. Um, I think the other, the other big question here, what is the, what is the timeline? I think the timeline is unknown. I think there is a, there has been an artificially created um, timeline of 2026 because you have these next two years, 24 and 25, and then the new TV contract for the college football playoff kicks off. That's certainly one factor, but I think the other factor is, is that these universities, these athletic directors and these conference commissioners, they're looking down the track and they're not there. It's not an empty train track anymore. They can see the locomotive coming yes. at them. They know that they need more money. They know that they need to change the system. You got to get back into a place where you're making enough money that it takes the stress off. Right. And, and yes. again, it, it's not a thing where it's like, Hey, there's a certain number that, you know, everyone's got to make for it to be a perfect, you know, you know, well-oiled machine. I, but I, but the, the, the concept and the premise is, Hey, w we know it, it, like it's a well-accepted fact that there is tons of money available to college football that, that they don't have access to currently because of the current That's system right. they operate in. So, so they're sitting here saying, okay, like ESPN sitting here saying, okay, why would we put in danger our business model when it comes to college football when we can figure out how to make this work? It's almost like, it's almost like, hey, like we just got to figure out a way to turn the freaking faucet on to feed this thing. This, if you if you think the college football is a plant, they just got to water it more. And that water is the money from private people and businesses and companies that want to be involved, that want to grow their company. Through college football, it's not a difficult premise. It, I just think that, like you said, the old folks in college football need to get the hell out of the way yeah. and let the Greg Sankeys well, of the world do this. And if you look at the new blood in leadership in college football, Tony Petiti, Brett Yormark, Greg Sankey's not new. Phillips at the ACC isn't new. 
But you look at the voices that are so prominent in the room now. You have TV savvy people that have an entertainment background and they understand that they are a sales organization that happens to play football. They are not a football organization that needs to sell its product. They're a sales organization that happens to play football. And when you have that mindset, money follows it. And I, I, I think that's why Brett Yormark, Tony Petiti, Greg Sankey's always been ahead of the curve. There, there, there's no question about that. Greg's always been forward thinking. I think he's an elite commissioner for that exact reason. And I think that that the ACC is in a different situation because they have litigation of their own uh, that they're trying to handle. And I think that you're seeing there's a lack of resolution on that. And we'll see. I mean, there, this FSU situation. To a lesser extent, Clemson, I think there that this situation with NIL and these lawsuits, and I think really the stability of the conference model in football anyway, I think greatly impacts the ability of FSU and Clemson to operate and to, to win court cases. I think it's it's going to be very difficult. All right. As always, the Monty Show presented by our good friends at uh, PrizePix, prizepix.com. Download the app. Use the promo code Monty. Boy, I was close. Man, I was close last night. Devin Booker absolutely came through. Anthony Davis. Anthony. He sucks. He's always hard. He's been terrible. Well, it turns out dude makes money for people on prize. After the street clothes, Davis. Both of them had big nights last night. Anthony Davis uh, essentially won me prize picks, uh, cashed my prize picks um, before 7 o'clock last night. It was beautiful. Cody Bellinger let me down. As soon as I, it's the best way I can say it. If Cody Bellinger isn't an overpriced <laughs> shitbag who I beg the Cubs to resign, I love my guy, Cody. Uh, he did let me down. I won two or three last night. Uh, thankfully, I had uh, Devin Booker on a demon. A um, demon. So I was able to win 56 25 last night on a $25 bet. Thank you, sir. How did Wait, you do? Awful. Terrible. Oh, did you lose? Not even close. Yeah, awful. I I had baseball last night, and that was not a good idea. I, I had, love baseball I had, and prize picks, dude, dude. I had Bellinger. He didn't come through. Yeah. Mookie Betts didn't come through. Tyler Glass now didn't come through. So whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Today's a new day, Jake. Yeah. Today is a new day. Yeah. Prize picks. Download the app. Use the promo code Monty. It's so easy to use, you guys. The reason I love prize picks, they ask you one question, more or less. I think the number on book last night was 46 and a half. I said more, came through with more. Eight assists. I mean, Stud. has anybody been diamond out like the sex machine, Devin Booker? The guy's the guy is just an absolute stud right now. Anthony Davis falling out. Cody Bellinger, two and a half total bases. Hits and RBIs. Oh for five. He's hitting 200. <coughs> okay. That's fine. So you know, I'll just. I'll yeah. just be over here. I'll just be over here. It's fine. Okay. It's good. All right, All right. Let's get your comments. Who are the first ones in this morning? Hello. Aaron Wilson gives a Monty Show membership. Let's go, baby. You guys, don't forget, tomorrow is Giving Friday on the show. We will give out $150 in Amazon gift cards tomorrow right here. On, well, you're going to have to perform, you know. So get the poll up in the living room. You're going to have to perform. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. I don't, don't want do to that. see that. Don't uh, but tomorrow is Giving Friday on the show. Uh, RJC Loner Phone, please forward to the Advocates for the Food Bank. Let's go. You guys, the Advocates are raising money uh, for the Murray uh, Children's Food Bank. You guys, help the Advocates, please. I am, I am begging you. Get on Venmo. If you don't have a Venmo account, it's super easy to set up. Venmo the Advocates, Advocates Donations. And if you could please shout out the Monty Show when you do that, we would really appreciate that. They are raising money and working with uh, the Murray Children's Pantry to end childhood hunger uh, in our communities. It's why I love the Advocates. Yes, they are great injury attorneys. Motorcycle accidents, trips and falls, slips, workman's comp issues. Did you get hurt at work? Absolutely. No matter what, no matter what. Anytime you get hurt at work, you need to find an independent voice who knows how to navigate the shark-infested waters of workman's comp. The Advocates at theadvocates.com, where you can always chat with an attorney live online, 24-7, 365, and it won't cost you a dime at theadvocates.com. 